All right. We're going to start with Noah Valenstein. He is the Secretary of the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. He served in that position since 2017 when then-Governor Rick Scott appointed him, and Governor Ron DeSantis reappointed him in February of this year. Uh, February 14th, it was Valentine's Day, and we call February 15th Valentine's Day, the day he was reappointed. He's done a tremendous service to our state in his capacity as Secretary of DEP. He obtained his undergraduate degree from the University of Florida and his law degree from Florida State University. He spent his entire professional career uh, in, in uh, has been involved in protecting water resources. Prior to being appointed Secretary of DEP, he was the Executive Director of the Suwannee River Water Management District. So please join me in welcoming the Secretary. Next up, I will introduce Dr. Tom Frazier. He was appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis to serve as the state's first chief science officer. Uh, prior to that, he was the director of the University of Florida School of Natural Resources and Environment, and he still continues to serve in that capacity. He received his bachelor's of science degree from Humboldt State University. He obtained his master's degree from the University of Florida, and he earned his PhD from UC Santa Barbara. Dr. Frazier oversees the Blue Green Algae Task Force, which was convened by Governor DeSantis to have consensus recommendations from environmental experts to guide the state in advancing environmental policies to help combat harmful algal blooms. Please welcome Dr. Frazier. And last but not least, Eric Eichenberg is the CEO of the Everglades Foundation, which is the only science-based nonprofit dedicated solely to protecting and restoring America's Everglades. Eric knows the political process well, having served as chief of staff to the late Congressman Clay Shaw, who was the author of the seminal legislation adopting the comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan. He also served as chief of staff to former Governor Charlie Crist. More recently, he served on Governor Ron DeSantis' environmental transition team, and he's currently the chair of the Oceans to Everglades initiative for the upcoming Super Bowl in Miami. Please welcome Eric Eichenberg. Thank you, Anna. All right. Is this on? Okay. So um, just a little bit about the format. What we're going to do, we're going to start with Eric giving an Everglades 101 overview, kind of explaining what Everglades restoration is about, why we're doing this, why we're spending all this money to get water flowing south, and uh, to, to tell them a little bit about what the Everglades Foundation does. Then we will turn it over to Secretary Valenstein to talk about the bold action Governor DeSantis took on day two in office with his executive order, laying out ways to improve our water quality and water resources. And then we will turn it over to Dr. Frazier to tell us about the work of the Blue Green Algae Task Force. Um, after that, I'll ask the panelists some general questions, and at the end, we'll open it up to audience questions. So with that, Eric, if you will get started, and I'll put your graphic up. Great. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And first, I want to congratulate uh, Chairman Neal and Dominic and the staff at Tax Watch on 40 years of, uh, of leadership here in our state. I have a minute and 30 seconds to give you an Everglades 101, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, maximize our time together. I thought, um, I thought Senator Lemieux's lunch presentation was uh, quite informative, and he touched on certainly the impact of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and uh, the pioneering that she made um, during her time and really raising the issue of Everglades restoration and the importance of the River of Grass to national prominence. But one, one individual that's in the book that was not covered is Governor Broward, Napoleon Bonaparte Broward, who back in the turn of the century uh, realizing that the opportunities to develop Florida started the draining, the diking, the damming, and ultimately the reduction of the original Everglades. The graphic that is on the screen in front of you um, shows the, um, on the left, we can maximize that, on the left it shows the pre-drainage flow um, from Orlando. If uh, those of you in the room, and many friends in the room who certainly know the importance of this ecosystem, but Shingle Creek, right near the Orlando airport, is the headwaters of the Everglades flowing south through the Kissimmee River Basin, hitting Lake Okeechobee. Um, and as it did many decades ago, that would flow south, uh, uninhibited through the River of Grass, the iconic River of Grass, and then ultimately making its way south to Florida Bay, 
and the Florida Keys. Um, as the 20th century economy in Florida began to develop, you can see the graphic on the right, which has a large uh, agricultural sector south of Lake Okeechobee. Certainly uh, eight and a half million people now that live in southeast Florida that need fresh water and that the water supply uh, of South Florida comes from America's Everglades. So that graphic there demonstrates the current water infrastructure that we have today. And as Lake Okeechobee fills up, um, we have witnessed out of the three of the last six summers, um, the impact of toxic water going east and west, and not only having a negative impact on the local environment, the ecology of those local environments, but also the economy and the economic hardships that we have um, that we've witnessed um, Congressman Mast mentioned about the health impacts. Uh, the Martin County Hospital District now has forms. If folks there go to the hospital, they check a box to ask if they've been in touch with the water uh, in the St. Lucie Estuary and the Indian River Lagoon. So we've seen the devastating impacts. And the good news from all of this, and we'll, we're going to hear why this is good news, because quite frankly, we're as optimistic here in 2019 as we've ever been that this generation, those of you in this room, including uh, my colleagues on this panel, are gonna ensure that the restoration of the Everglades occurs so that we can have perpetual protection of this um, important natural resource. So as the water concerns and the crises developed, uh, the plan that Anna mentioned that was passed by Congress in 2000 we're two weeks away from the anniversary of Bill Clinton signing the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, a 68-project plan, at the time, $8.5 billion, and the idea is, was that we would finish it in 30 years. This is in the year 2000. So we're now entering a new decade. January 1st, we enter a new decade, and we're now 20 years into this largest ecosystem restoration project in the history of the world. We are seeing tangible progress today. It's happening because of the leadership that we have now with Governor DeSantis and his desire and his commitment to making this his number one priority. Uh, we'll talk what that means, but this is the way it looks today, previous, now today, and that natural restored Everglades is more to the graphic on the left a more natural flow from Lake Okeechobee, from Orlando to Lake Okeechobee, and naturally down to the Florida Keys. That's what it's about. It's great to be with you this afternoon. Before we move on, Eric, uh, we've made a lot of progress in the past few years on Everglades restoration, and part of that has been due to dedicated funding for Everglades restoration. Can you speak to that and how having dedicated funding for Everglades restoration projects has helped us advance the ball? The only way we're going to do this is with money, with funding, and it takes money out of Tallahassee as well as Washington. And when this plan was signed by the President of the United States, it calls for a 50-50 cost share between Florida and Washington. So every, every dollar the state invests, we get that dollar match coming out of D.C. And folks like Representative Kelly, who spent his time in the Florida House, and Governor Kotkamp, when he was in the House, voting to ensure appropriations go towards these critical projects, um, really started the need and started the desire to have restoration become a reality. So we have the state of Florida, which is about almost a billion and a half ahead of Washington in our investment. Um, but we're working with our delegation. Senator Rubio, in particular, now serving on the Senate Appropriations Committee is critical in working with uh, all stakeholders to ensure these dollars come down to Florida to make this happen. But what's, what, I'll leave you with this point. When we talk about infrastructure in this country, and we heard about transportation infrastructure as a bipartisan effort, this is water infrastructure. So we, we don't bat an eye when we have to dredge the Miami port to receive Panamax ships. We don't bat an eye when the Orlando airport is expanding to take on more travelers and commerce. We shouldn't bat an eye when we talk about reservoirs, when we talk about uh, pipes and, and, and infrastructure across our state and the investment that's needed. This is water infrastructure. The Everglades is the water supply for a third of the population of this state, and it's vitally important that Washington follow the lead of Tallahassee and we get it done. You're here. 
All right, uh, Mr. Secretary, can you talk a little bit about Governor DeSantis's executive order? Uh, I think it's 19 12, and his uh, desire to get dedicated funding for water quality and Everglades initiatives. Sure. So I would start by saying, and I'll comment on actually the Senator's lunchtime presentation too, which was a great presentation. And one of the things that I noticed was the discussion of disruptors in Florida's history, right? And you can sometimes lose focus that you have the same potential for disruptors um, today and the future. You think about mosquitoes, you think about the things we overcome in, overcame in the past, and you forget that that reality exists today. And as the governor came into office, and I think certainly everyone here lived through the same election cycle and noticed a few uh, TV commercials, probably had a lot of uh, goings-ons around you. Um, certainly we were aware of it, and we were aware that the environment was front and center, and there's a good reason for that. Right? If you're here in the state of Florida, likely a portion of the reason you're here, your business, your family, your enterprise, is because of the natural resource or because you want to be located next to a natural resource. That also means our natural resources have a great potential to be a tremendous disruptor if something goes wrong. Right? I mean, you think about some of the largest vulnerabilities to the state of Florida. Uh, the center again was right for talking about sea level rise, water quality, water quantity, things that if we get wrong will have a tremendous impact on the economy way of life in our state, right? And those threats exist today. Water quality was really the one um, that took center stage in this past election cycle, right? You saw recurring large scale blue green algae blooms in multiple areas throughout Florida, both estuaries in South Florida. You also saw them going on the St. John's River in North Florida. And to have multiple events like that the thing, to, at least to me, that I heard going around the state was to have them happen in a repetitive fashion signaled a level of disruption that created uncertainty in the market and had a really significant impact, not just recognition for the environment, but on the economy. And so you see the same thing that we heard about during lunch have the potential to occur today. And so during the transition, you heard a lot of discussion about what can we do now? You know, what more can we do now to really ramp up our approach to the environment? I think another way of thinking about that as we talk about, talked through the transition again with Congressman Mass leading the way on the environment was how do we give a sense of certainty to the population of Florida that the environment is going to be healthy and sound and that we're gonna be able to address issues that we have in front of us, right? I mean, because the, the the reality is we will always have challenges, and certainly the expectation from our community and businesses and families is not to have the world be absolutely perfect and that every problem be solved at all times, but simply to say if there's a problem, what is the roadmap for the solution? When will we get there? And do we have faith that that sounds like an executable plan and that the state is doing it in a transparent fashion that everyone can follow along and say, great, we'll reach there. We have certainty in the marketplace. Again, we can move along in our daily lives. Traveling around the state, I also heard very often questions of either someone in the agricultural industry who's had, you know, multi-generation farm, um, folks in the, uh, you know, either restaurant industry or hospitality industry, um, businesses all saying, you know, I didn't get into this business to have to talk about my level of impact on the environment and what I'm doing, right? The lack of certainty led to this interesting fact of, everyone having to say what they were doing because frankly at that point I don't think there was faith in the state's plan and there was uncertainty about the end point and so probably folks in this room have possibly either had your own business or known a business that started getting increased question and scrutiny as to what are you doing are you part of the problem right that happened a lot a finger pointing of are you the reason I'm experiencing this I want this experience to end and I don't have faith in a plan that's being executed, so I will start wondering who is the, the cause of the problem and what are they doing about it, right? And so I certainly heard a lot of comments of, you know, I would like to just get back to my job, meet my permit conditions, and enjoy the environment, but not have to think about it on a daily basis. I expect you, State, to be doing that as part of your job, right? And so to me, that was the backdrop of what led into the beginning of the governor's um, term. And so I will say we have grown um, accustomed to a fast pace. I have probably now a somewhat famously casual 
um, attire in part because I became used to being essentially in part of emergency management mode for either being out responding to a red tide or blue green algae bloom. And you have a sense of urgency. If you've ever had the privilege to be in the State Emergency Operations Center, um, Florida will make you, you proud. It's a great group of folks working tirelessly around the clock to make sure we're responding to disasters. And there is a level of efficiency and certainty and clarity of mission that you get when you're there. Um, and so through the transition, we as an agency really realized that's not something we were prepared to give up, right? Um, during deployments, again, either for red tide or blue green algae, we recognize this is a level of focus and urgency that we need to maintain until we as an agency feel like we've done a sufficient job to have that clarity in the marketplace that citizens believe we have a path forward that is gonna address the concerns we have for the environment here in Florida. And so the governor has set the tempo for that. As Anna mentioned, it only took a couple of days for the governor to be at the water's edge in Southwest Florida announcing an executive order that the bulk of the focus at the time was funding of $2.5 billion over four years for water quality, a massive increase in funding. So $625 million a year. We're talking order of magnitude increase in funding and water quality. There was a lot more in that order. The order also had a fundamental change in how we were operating as an agency, and I'll mention a few of those things. First was making sure we have the resources needed, which was the funding, right? The second was making sure that we're utilizing tools we have, recognizing that you can't ever have a conversation about what new tool do you need, what should you do in order to respond to the environment, if you haven't been actually using the things that the legislature or governor gave to you before, right? So the question was, are you enforcing the regulations you have? Are you being rigorous enough about how you're implementing your permit? And you need to do that. And so as we stand here today, we've had more inspections on our permittees who we have a great collaborative relationship with, but that we need to be out inspecting. We've had more inspections this year than in the history of the agency. We also now have sworn law enforcement officers back in the agency going through and actually um, investigating and then bringing charges forward for felony criminal crimes, which unfortunately is not the norm, but absolutely still occur in Florida and we need to have that level of enforcement. And then the third prong was science and science in a way that the community can be involved, right? Not science for collecting data and not having the community involved as Florida, we actually led the nation in collection of data and having water quality data um, being brought in. But frankly, we weren't doing a great job as an agency on making certain that we were allowing the public to engage in that data and help steer. Again, the concept of if a business or a family or your local community doesn't have faith that our agency is able to do our job, restore the Everglades, protect water quality, you'll have disruption in the marketplace and you'll have um, what we've experienced the last few years. And so through that restructuring, we have the first chief science officer in the state's history, which we're um, excited to have on board at the department. We also have the first chief resiliency officer for the state. I think we're the only state to have that two-tiered system of a CRO and a chief science officer together helping make sure that we've got that conversation occurring in Florida. We also started about um, as part of, of Tom coming on board, having more transparency and accountability, which was part of a recent website that we released, which was making sure when we're having these conversations that the public is able to hold us accountable. And so all that together, I think the Everglades is the perfect thing sort of to discuss. What does that mean for an outcome where you have a sense of urgency, accountability, science leading the way, the public being able to engage, is you start to see things happening and happening more quickly, right? This just in the past couple months we have, and this, these are sort of a list of things that you would normally think take a, a year or more. Um, we had groundbreaking in C43, we had a ribbon cutting in C44. These are the two main reservoirs on the west and east coast. We moved leases and basically terminated leases for the um, EAA reservoir south of Lake Okeechobee to make sure that there was no more barrier to moving forward with that reservoir and did it in a way where all parties were able to contribute to that. Um, we also had Tamiami Trail, right? Uh, a long-standing blockage to water moving south, all just this year in one short period of time. And so we're seeing tremendous movement forward. 
that would not occur but for that sort of focus on folks working together, sharing data, and a sense that we can't have disruption longer. We can't have the unknown of whether this is going to occur any longer. And so, again, with that dedicated funding, again, the governor's asking for the $625 million a year this year dedicated um, with increased enforcement. Again, our second legislative proposal this year with the governor is increased fines, so 50% increase on all environmental fines. Um, and then lastly, that focus on water quality, which I know Tom will discuss and I'll just mention briefly, was an illustration of how the process has changed is typically we have had a hard time dealing with large policy changes where we nibble around the edges and as an agency haven't been bringing forward um, large policy changes. Um, I think probably the only time you've seen policy changes on water quality that span everything from stormwater to wastewater um, and beyond agriculture is actually been for a DREG or a conversation to how to make something more efficient, but not about how are we moving the ball down the road on water quality. So this year, the governor's proposed comprehensive water quality legislation that would strengthen our stormwater requirements, strengthen wastewater requirements, improve how we manage agricultural runoff, and that was all run through a collaborative process of the Blue Green Algae um, Task Force run by Tom. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Anna or over to Tom. I think that's the perfect transition. So take it away, Dr. Frazier. Yeah, perfect. So uh, as Anna pointed out, I do have the, the pleasure of facilitating the discussions and the deliberations of the task force, but also have the responsibility of synthesizing all of their comments and putting it in the form of a recommendation. And hopefully I can share some of those with you today. The, the list is long, and I brought a bit of a, a cheat sheet so I don't forget some of the things. But um, before I get into some of the specifics, I would say that the task force recognized that um, part of the issue with dealing with blue-green algae blooms and, and red tide is getting the water right in South Florida. And so that means getting Everglades restoration on track. So the more latitude that you have in storing and treating and conveying that water uh, greatly enhances our ability to uh, to deal with the blue-green algae problem and also the red tide issues. Uh, with regard to some of the specific recommendations coming out of the task force this round, and I say this round is because there certainly will be more moving forward, uh, but we were fairly aggressive. Uh, we had a short timeline given the, the early legislative session, and we focused on issues that we thought were leading to the blue-green algae blooms and identifying source materials. So um, there's no particular order here. I think that we all play a part in, in nutrient pollution in this state, and we all have something to do about it. But the task force, again, recognized that, uh, particularly in the South Florida watershed, watersheds, that agriculture plays a big role, right? It's an important part of our economy. They generate $100 billion a year, but they also generate um, you know, nutrient waste that contributes to environmental degradation. So we have to get that under control. And the way that we do that is by using uh, best management practices. And the recommendations, again, coming out of the task force is that we probably need to improve um, those BMPs. And it starts in, with this. You know, about 75% of the land uh, that's in agricultural holdings um, are not, are, excuse me, are enrolled in those BMPs, but we could do better. You know, we could get full compliance with those BMPs and reduce the environmental degradation as a consequence of those agricultural practices. Those practices in and of themselves aren't going to fix our water quality problem, problems. We know that, right? But it's an integral part in getting things right and, and improving the environment down the road. We also know that to make sure that we are getting that right, we need to increase the inspections there, right? Compliance, better record keeping. We need to know what goes on those agricultural properties, what comes off those agricultural properties. We need to know what those nutrients look like when we're looking at a balance on a sub-watershed scale and the entire watershed scale. So increased monitoring uh, is a key recommendation coming out of the task force. Um, I guess with that said, that you know we moved straight into septic systems, and we have 2.5 million of them in this state. 12% of all the septic systems in the United States are in Florida. They're a, a public health issue, um, but they're also a nutrient pollution issue. And recognizing that, the task force said, hey, you know, we probably need some broader regulatory oversight and recommend it, in fact, that moving down the road that we have increased inspections um, for those septic systems. We quit permitting, essentially, septic systems in environmentally sensitive areas, right? And we aggressively pursue septic to uh, sewer conversion systems 
where they make sense, right? It, it doesn't make sense, however, to, can, to try to um, inspire those types of programs, but when we have a thousand people here moving every day and permitting new traditional septic systems, right? So we have to get that balance right. Hopefully that people are listening to those types of recommendations. Um, sanitary sewer overflows, they seem to be in the news all the time. They're a big issue, right? Again, just like septic systems, they're both a, a public health issue, but they're also an environmental problem. And we could do better in that regard. So what are we gonna do? Probably need better inspections. Uh, we have problems with infiltration and inflow, essentially leaky pipes, right? And we need to get ahead of that game so we don't let that infrastructure fall into disrepair. Uh, it's, it's critical to, again, our economic well-being uh, in the state of Florida. We also could probably do better with regard to um, some of the, um, the emergency backup power in our lift stations. We have thousands of those across the state, and when we have uh, environmental disasters or uh, weather events, storms, hurricanes of that nature, and they get shut down, those cause big problems. That's an easy fix for us, kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, stormwater treatment systems. You know, just like agricultural BMPs, they're designed to uh, perform or achieve some type of a performance. We know the data just clearly show that they're not uh, performing as they were designed. So we could do better in that regard. We could, we could increase our inspection, right? We could uh, do the monitoring that we need to indicate where uh, those stormwater systems are failing or not achieving the performance that, that we hope that they would. So ultimately down the road, we hope that we would, might um, adopt a statewide uh, stormwater uh, treatment plan. Um, and I think that would reap great benefits uh, headed down the road. We spent a lot of time also talking, I mean, the list is long, so stop me when you want, but, you know, talking about innovative technologies. And I think that's really key moving forward. You know, two years ago when we were having, um, you know, tremendous blue green algae blooms, red tide issues, a lot of focus was on cleanup and mitigation. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had the same level of impact this past year, but the task force recognized that we need technologies that address Again, the cleanup, right? We got, if it's gonna happen and we have an, an outbreak or bloom somewhere, we need to get rid of it. It's not good for the, the tourism industry. Um, but at the same time, we need to diversify our portfolio a little bit. We can't always be playing catch up, right? We need to get ahead of the game and the task force recognize that we implement technologies that are gonna be aid us in the prevention of uh, blue green algae blooms moving forward. Um, let me see, getting close to the end on it. Well, maybe one more, huh? Um, public health was a big issue as well, right? We can do a better job about communicating the, the message, you know, about environmental degradation, uh, what those public Im uh, health impacts are, and in order to do that, it means we need to work more effectively with our sister agencies, the Department of Health, the FWRI. I think we're doing a good job in that regard moving forward. No indicated, you know, part of the Office of Environmental Accountability and Transparency is uh, communicating better with the public, right? So, but we also need to communicate better with the agencies, bring that data all in one place, synthesize it, let people know where we're making improvements. It's not just about pointing out where we have problems, but saying, hey, you know, there's a lot of water in Florida. We got a thousand miles of coastline, 10,000 lakes, thousands of miles of rivers and streams. There's a lot of really good places to go, even if you have a red tide outbreak in Naples or something of that nature, right? And I think that we could do a better job of communicating all of the good things that we're doing in this state to the 21.7 million people that live here and the 100 million visitors that come as well. So I think that's probably enough. That was great. Thank you. Um, you mentioned public health. I, I wanted to let the audience know in 2017, Tax Watch authored a report on the cost of inaction. If we don't address our water crisis, mainly dealing with Lake Okeechobee, what are, what's the public cost if we don't do anything. And health crisis was, was one of the issues. It was health, it was um, our tourism uh, industry. It, our economy is so tied to tourism. And Amy Baker, our economist, notes that little events, little ev environmental events have a huge impact on our economy. So as Eric noted, it's not just about the environment, it's about the economy. So Dr. Frazier, you kind of, uh, already went to one of my questions, but how do you guys see innovation helping solve Florida's water issues? You touched on it. Why don't you, why don't you take the lead and then others, if you have ideas, jump in. 
Yeah, again, I think it's innovative technologies aren't, shouldn't be constrained to just cleaning things up, right? I think there's new technologies that would allow us to treat water better, for example. Um, you know, sensors, for example, that allow us to identify and forecast where those algal blooms are going to occur so we can, you know, act more proactively so that we don't let them get out of hand. Um, but it's hard, right? I mean, these are big problems on, on big spatial scales, and everybody seems to have an idea. You know, recently we put out uh, an RFI request for information for people that, you know, could uh, compete for $10 million for innovative technology dollars that NOAA indicated was in the governor's uh, budget uh, approved by the legislature. And we got a great response for that, maybe 100 different respondents. And we put out a grant solicitation a couple of weeks ago, um, and the proposals are coming in. And so they're partnerships with industry um, and, and local governments. And part of those proposals will be, well, how do we deal with the nutrient issue right up front so we don't have these algal blooms? So I see it playing a, a big role moving forward. Um, and again, it's, it's partners. It's, it's not just uh, the state agencies. It's private industry. It's the academia. It's people like the Everglades Foundation. I know the Barley Prize that you guys are working on it fits right in that alley. And, and I value those partnerships, and I think that um, the agency certainly does. Yeah, I would mention, I mean, we're not just trying to protect the environment of, in Florida, right? I mean, the reality is we'll have more folks moving to Florida, and that's a great thing, right? We love this state for a reason, and more families, more businesses, economic growth is something we want to occur. The brilliance about Florida is we're able to show we can protect the environment and grow the economy at the same time. That's going to come with challenges, though, right? And we're going to need a level of innovation above just having good base operating programs that allow us to do more in more densely populated areas adjacent to lands we're protecting. Again, Everglades, the thing that's so brilliant about Everglades really has us on a map around the world is it's not just that we're restoring a wetland, which plenty of people can do, but the scale of it is larger than anywhere else. So that in itself is an achievement but that you're doing it next to a growing, thriving metropolitan area, next to an agricultural area, productive, uh, more productive than many, many places in the world, um, and that all three things are occurring simultaneously, right? The more we grow as a state, that's gonna require innovation. And so starting now with the program that we have, I think hopefully plant some seeds, certainly, you know, to have groups like the Everglades Foundation, the Barley Prize, to have catalysts out there sort of creating a sense of innovation and competition is gonna be key. And the more we can have things like that, both in the state and private sector and nonprofit is gonna be great. We also have to be innovative on um, permitting and just processes. Again, unfortunately, some of the biggest things that were in our way as hurdles were, you know, a state leasing its own land to process that they needed you know, they need the land actually to put a reservoir in as opposed to what we're leasing it for. It shouldn't be that complicated, much like also one of the big obstacles we have now is permitting. Better permitting time means projects getting through more quickly. And so I think we've got to be more innovative about how we're handling some of the just traditional government side issues too. If I may, the, uh, if you recall in August of 2014, the city of Toledo, Ohio shut down its water supply due to blue-green toxic algae from Lake Erie infiltrating its municipal supply. And we were invited by the mayor of Chicago to come up and, and visit with 18 mayors who represent cities and towns around the Great Lakes, including Canada. At that time, we had a, um, we had a donor put up $10 million to uh, have us create a prize. Let's do a, let's do a competition. Let's tap into the private sector to this point, um, government has not been able to solve the problem, although we've got now a refocus here at the state level. Um, and what we found with putting $10 million on the table is it brought innovators, entrepreneurs, it tapped into that entrepreneurial spirit to solve a problem. And it's not isolated just to the Everglades. It's a Great Lakes issue. It's a Chesapeake Bay. It's uh, around the world. Uh, Blue-green algae, excess phosphorus particularly, is a problem globally. So we, again, what we have found is there's a great enthusiasm to solve the problem. And we took nine teams up to Toronto and they spent three months on a polluted lake just north of, uh, of Toronto there in Ontario. And the key from that experience was the data of having all the uh, 10,000 gallons, a small scale, 10,000 gallons a day going through these 
cargo containers of whatever technology that they had created. We had a team from China, a team from the Netherlands. We had universities present. Um, so this has really moved this dialogue forward that, um, that we can solve this problem. And it takes the private sector and technology to do so. So now working with Dr. Frazier and the secretary and the governor of how we can enhance technological advances, I think that's the key. But when you just go to the broader, if I may too, on the broader environmental topic or the Everglades, we've made this an economic argument. And uh, Dana Young should be sitting here and the secretary of DEO should be here because again, as goes Florida's economy, goes its environment. And the turning point for the Everglades Foundation was after the lost summer of 2013, if you remember, those experiences, when we had realtors, we had realtors from around this state stand up and say they cannot transact, they cannot sell real estate or sell homes when you have toxic blue-green algae in the backyard waterway. And it doesn't just impact the home that's there, it's the subdivision, it's the community, it goes on and on. So when realtors said we have to fix it, and when they made it part of their legislative agenda, and then we had boat manufacturers and anglers Folks that rely upon the waterways for a living, that's when this debate turned. Not a, if I may characterize it as a left-leaning, liberal, Birkenstock-wearing, tree-hugging issue. No, this was the future of, of Florida. The economy of Florida uh, weighs heavily on a restored Everglades and clean water. And what we took to folks like Tom Feeney when he was in the United States Congress was we did an economic report that shows for every dollar you invest, it's a $4 return. And real estate is the number one industry in this state that benefits from clean water and a restored Everglades. And as Anna mentioned, this was critical. This tax watch study of the cost of inaction during the debate in Tallahassee with Senate Bill 10, flowing water south, that was critical to ensuring that both parties understood what was at stake. So again, we're, we're making great progress and it's important that we keep our shoulder to it as we go forward. What are some of the major environmental issues or obstacles, I like the word you use, Noah, obstacles that are still facing our state today? Some major obstacles or issues. And I promise I'll end on a high note, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I started sea level rise as a huge huge issue. I mean, I, again, we think of public health issues and major disruptors um, are the things we don't want to see as an agency, us not addressing. Um, look at Southeast Florida, sea level rise has a tremendous impact to be a disruptor. Um, water supply, Central Florida. Um, we have two collaborations going on between multiple districts, water, water management districts, making sure we have a sufficient amount of water to allow continued growth. But this is an area of Florida right now where the margin right now is smaller than it should be. And so we wanna make sure that we're making progress there. Um, it, public health issues such as emerging contaminants of concern, I think is gonna be another one that we have to, to monitor. Um, but I would say if we're doing it correctly, right, and we have programs in place, that give that level of certainty. Don't fix the problem immediately, but at least have that impact. Um, and that at least lets me sleep at night. And I'll mention, you know, it's getting to the point of as far as realizing that those environmental problems, as far as water supply, water quality, um, are of such a magnitude that it's being considered even and commented on when the state goes for its bond rating, right? So when we're financing the state itself and go up for bond rating meetings, they actually are now identifying and looking at are you able to address and do you have plans in place? Not have you fixed completely, right? Um, sea level rise is not gonna be eliminated. The question is, do you have a legitimate plan on place and can we have confidence that the state will execute? And some of our bond ratings now um, are actually noting, hey, you have the great bond rating that you do in part because you have believable plans in place and we have faith that the state's gonna act to address those challenges. I think too, the, um, I agree with what the secretary just said and sea level rise is something we need to address. And as we keep more fresh water on the peninsula, mm -hmm. instead of wasting it out to the Atlantic and the Gulf, it recharges the aquifer, which acts as a buffer to push and, and defend against um, saltwater intrusion. But when, when I hear what could be the challenges, I, I, what I fear is amnesia. 
you know, we, we experience these summers and then we go with summer and then we don't have it and then it happens again and people sometimes forget and you hear often that we've been restoring the Everglades for two decades, going on three. And this, this fatigue, this fatigue concern. Um, so we, we really have to now double down and when you have political will, when you have the political leadership at the top, understanding the connection between the environment and the economy, um, it has been the last, the last 11 months we've accomplished more than we had in the previous decade. And again, it, it, it falls right in the lap of Governor DeSantis who picked this up and has made it his top priority. And uh, I think that's the challenge which has now turned into a major opportunity. All right, and so I promise we'll leave on a high note. Um, it's, you know, the, the bad stuff that happens to our water is what n normally makes the news, but we have had a lot of environmental successes in our state, and everyone on this panel has been part of an environmental success story. So um, if you have a success story you'd like to share and give the audience some takeaways on how you were able to be successful in that particular um, occurrence, then go ahead and share. Noah, do you want to start? <laughs> sure. So I'll start bragging about myself. No. Yes. I would, um, I, I mean, it sounds corny, but the governor's leadership, certainly the first lady, um, I'm sure hopefully everyone here in the room has had the opportunity to meet the governor and first lady, and you hear them talk about their connection to the environment. Certainly the first lady is incredibly impassionate about why the environment matters and tells stories about having to go to the hospital and um, for the birth of a child and be asked the question of, were you in or near a water body in your community recently as a public health issue? And just thinking, you know, aghast as to how horrible that was that a Floridian had to be asked that as a public health issue. Um, and so I, to me, the accomplishment that I am just excited to be part of is where we stand right now, we're stand out clearly as a state among the nation as being willing to view the economy and the environment as not two things fighting each other, but two things dependent on each other, to have problems, but being willing to tackle them, to be able to grow our economy at the same time and not to be shy about it, right? And to be passionate about it, um, forceful about it, urgent about it. And you look around at so many other states and there's a stumbling block of, one, you wouldn't see environmental groups up at a business meeting with an environmental agency head simply because things weren't working well in that state. Everything, everyone had gone to their corners. Um, so I'm just proud where we are as a state. I think hopefully, you know, the next major breakthrough on the scientific side for blue-green algae treatment is gonna come from Florida. I have no doubt in my mind. The largest ecosystem restoration project in the world is gonna be completed here in Florida, right? We're gonna have the largest growing economy and still be leading the nation, right, as a state and we're gonna show that we can have sustainable water supplies, have really vibrant protected lands. Um, and to me, that gives a roadmap and should make other states, countries excited that they should believe they can have you know, cake and eat it too. And I think that's probably the most, best, most important accomplishment we can have. Wow. Well said, yeah. Dr. Frazier. I mean, I've had an opportunity to work on environmental problems all around the world, so. Um, but I would agree with Noah. Man, this is a really exciting time to be in Florida. I mean, it's from my perspective as a, as a scientist, um, I mean, data and, um, and science are the hallmark, really, of good progressive environmental policy. And it, for the last decade or so, science has got kind of a bad name, right, in the regulatory arena and, and, and policy in general. It's really, really satisfying to be up here and be able to kind of collect information, work with a broad group of stakeholders, make that information available to our legislators, our governor, environmental groups, all of our partners, right, to move Florida forward. Because again, I keep coming back to some of the things that were said, particularly Center of Amuse talk, you know, we are the fourth largest economy in the state, you know, 17th largest economy in the world. And what we do here really matters, right? We can extend an example, but it's more than that. I think we have responsibility to do that. And I think that we have the team in place to do it right now. So I think it's a good time for Florida, I really do. I think we're, um, we're part of a long journey uh, when it comes to improving on Florida's environment. He's not in this room, but when you see him, I think it's important that we thank uh, Governor Martinez, Bob Martinez, for 
um, his, uh, his efforts when he was our governor, our 40th governor, um, the reforms that he put in place and the programs that were implemented under his tenure continue to this day. Um, so every administration, every legislature has moved the ball down the field to take the Super Bowl uh, comment. Um, what I think, uh, I think to be um, what's been most promising is that the business community, as Noah said, has stepped up in a big way. This is, this is critical, that chambers of commerce. Chambers of commerce on the East and West Coast have now come together to make Everglades restoration, clean water part of their legislative agendas. And that's, that's helpful when you go to Tallahassee and legislators who are in this room, they expect to hear it from us. But when they're hearing it from a local business leader or a uh, leader of a chamber of commerce, it maybe sets off a different tone or listening um, to then move forward and make it a reality. So we have this moment, and the key here is not to um, abide by the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different outcome. We now have this moment. This generation is going to step up and ensure that these projects, these infrastructure projects, fresh water is cleaned, it's stored, and ultimately it's sent south from Orlando down to the Florida Keys. America's Everglades is counting on all of us, and we're excited to make it a reality. All right. Well, thank you, panelists. Um, audience members, if you have questions, okay. Mm -hmm. Really tough, as we know. Could you possibly publish quarterly at least the true story of what's going on in this area? You know, the media either sensationalizes or omits. Whereas, if you could put your story out, a simple newsletter, we get them on education, we get them on other areas. Let's have it on your area, on water. Now, my question we have the aging population of municipalities now. You know, I've lived here over 40 years. And some of the water systems in some of the municipalities, we're not like other states with the big municipalities with big water systems. We have a lot of tiny around the state. So not only do we have to worry about the quality of water, we have to worry about the delivery of water. We just had a problem in Fort Lauderdale. I've had problems in other parts of the state where I've been on business. We really need to increase. What are we doing with the increased inspection and requirements for municipalities and water systems? Thank you. Mr. Secretary, um, I can see the wheels turning because you have <laughs> some good answers to that statement slash question. You want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll take the, I'll go backwards on you. So one for, as far as transmission of water, you're talking wastewater or drinking water. And certainly we're a state that developed very quickly after the wars, um, you know, there are other large states, obviously California is another good example where you saw sort of large scale development all at one time, which means you have infrastructure phasing out all at the same time. Wastewater in particular was notorious for, um, you know, the operators in large part municipalities um, not putting the money needed into O&M, right? Underground, unknown, don't necessarily, you gotta do a lot of expensive inspections to see it deteriorating. Um, and you can get behind very quickly. So part of the governor's legislation that Tom mentioned put some additional requirements in place for wastewater to make sure that if you have a wastewater utility as a local government, you've got to inspect it on a yearly basis, know what your problem is. You seem like pretty basic things, but they weren't happening, right? What's your problem? Do you have a funding plan to fix your problem, right? And are you funding it? three very simple things that, believe it or not, are not happening today, right? You've got sanitary sewer overflows, as Tom mentioned, I'm sure everyone's read about them, um, happening throughout Florida because someone doesn't know what the problem is, doesn't have a plan to fund the problem, right? And then isn't putting money into it. And then we come in at the end, once a problem has occurred, take them to court, get a consent order, and make those three things happen. Common sense would suggest we could probably skip going to court and making those three things happen by having the regulatory authority to actually require that planning ahead of time. So I'm hopeful as we come out of this legislative session, we'll actually see that occur, right? 
Septic is another, and we have very, dis I, I would say we actually probably, for other states, for wastewater and drinking water, we actually have probably medium to large size systems in comparison, but what we do have on the wastewater side is a lot of septic tanks. And so the other thing that Tom mentioned was with septic, for the first time in the history of Florida, if this legislation passes, we'll say, when the program comes over to ZEP, we will actually permit septic systems as a source of nutrient, not just as a public health issue. And from that point forward, yes, you'll still be able to use septic, but the right type of septic and only the right place, meaning you're not further contributing to the problem. So if we can just stop digging the hole, again, a pretty basic concept, right, then we'll be able to start funding our way out. But I think you've got to know what the problem is and then have the funding. And I 100% agree on getting the story out. Our comms site tells me that a website and social media is more effective than the newsletter. And so that's part of our new portal on water quality that hopefully you'll go to. It's protectingfloridatogether.com.gov, um, either one. And you should be able to get data in very simple terms, learn how to volunteer, hold us accountable and see what we're doing. And we're looking to expand that, not to sort of simply put out our side of the story. There shouldn't be a side, right? It should be a, here's what's happening. and you should be able to look at that and hold us as an agency accountable for doing our job. Anybody else? So three questions. I didn't hear in your summary of your proposals that are coming out of the Blue Green Algae Task Force, what role, if any, the deep water injection wells will play in the future, because I know that was an issue of contention in South Florida when the South Florida Water Management District had proposed in 2018 to invest in those. Secondly, on the, on the septic tank issue, what recommendations are gonna come forth for some kind of innovative financing models? Because at the end of the day, municipalities can't afford to do this. Counties alone can't afford to do it for their unincorporated areas. So there's gotta be a partnership. And then the third question was saltwater intrusion. How are we dealing with that? So it's a, a couple of things. One, with regard to the deep water injection wells, as I said early on, um, what the task force recommended that we get the storage and treatment right so that we can move water appropriately. And when you step back and you look at all the projects that are going on in the South Florida ecosystems, that's part of that plan, right? But it needs to be uh, evaluated properly and recognize where it actually fits in the puzzle. So I don't think that um, that's necessarily gone away. Um, it's, you know, it's part of the storage issue. It's not necessarily part of the water, rate, water delivery issue for me as I, as I see it right now. So the task force didn't spend a lot of time, uh, especially on, on that one. So uh, I would, thought I would address that question with regard to uh, the second one. What was the second one again? Yeah. yeah, and again, the task force did. They made that recommendation, right, that we need to find uh, support and funding for um, economically defensible conversion of septic systems to uh, central sewers. That's difficult to do, as I said before. We've got 2.5 million septic systems in the state. We can't do it everywhere, right? So what we're trying to do is synthesize the data that are available, get the right information so we can make informed decisions about where we prioritize those investments. Where are the vulnerable areas? Because we can't do it everywhere. The, the legislature appropriated $50 million to... Uh, address or look at this aquifer storage or deep well injection, whatever addition that they're potentially going to uh, take. Um, they, and Dr. Frazier's here, so he can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the issue is what we need, the state needs data. The agency in particular needs data on how that type of technology um, will work. Um, certainly there's wells around the state for drinking water, but the depth at which the agency and others want to go down uh, needs to be tested and, and proven. So from the Everglades Foundation's perspective, let's use the 50 million that the legislature has appropriated, the governor signed in the budget. Let's develop these test wells. Let's get the data that's necessary um, because some talk about shooting six times the amount of Lake Okeechobee water down into the boulder zone, which it's called, or the um, three or 4,000 feet. There's a lot of unknowns about where that water uh, percolates or goes, um, but part of the comprehensive plan on Everglades restoration calls for aquifer storage and recovery. Um, that is part of the toolbox. It just needs to be refined and demonstrated that we're getting the best return for that investment. 
as that's being figured out, we've got all these reservoirs above ground that are coming online or that are starting to be constructed. So if you give it another five to eight years, you're gonna see tremendous benefit of sending flowing water south. I want to say we've got the largest budget we've ever had as an agency in the history of the state to deal with these water quality issues. So we are never gonna have the state fund our way out of an infrastructure problem for local utilities, right? Not the purpose of the state to do that. What we can have though is recognize that there is a transition that has to occur from septic needing to come offline um, to some of the key sort of problems we have on water quality and be targeted about where we're putting state money. And if we've got a program in place that forces folks to deal with the reality of having to invest and maintain their utility or only put septic in the appropriate type of septic in the appropriate location, um, then we'll be okay. But again, it's to stop digging the hole, first of all. But in addition to our funding, we've got um, loan programs that are currently being used by communities for septic conversion. We've got a lot of different opportunities. I think there have been discussions by some local communities of looking at different tax options for um, homeowners and so on. Um, to me, the key, though, is to create that construct where you can't have this externality of, well, I'm not going to address the issue until you tell me, you know, I have to get the septic tank regulated for nutrients or you tell me, oh, I guess I do have to inspect my utility system and I do have to have a plan. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you, panelists. You guys are great. Um, Florida Tax Force has an upcoming report on a return on investment economically on what Governor DeSantis recommended the legislature is appropriated at $680 million. So I think it's uh, it, the drafts is very, very positive. But more importantly, what else can we do to ensure that we fund this on a recurring basis, okay, put it in the recurring budget? And two, um, what's the estimated time frame, uh, Anna and gentlemen, that you think it will take to have a significant input? It, it, the job's never done. I know it's always a, it's more of a journey than a destination, but, but there's a certain sense of a destination. When will we get to that flow, Eric, that you have shown up there? that it's really meaningful and really begins to stop the salt water intrusion into our freshwater systems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 10 years. Perfect. 10 years. So <laughs> it could be a bold <laughs> statement, but my goodness, 10 years, 2030 to 20, 2020 to 2030, if we have the type of investment that we're seeing now out of Tallahassee, and if we are able to get two to 300 million a year from Washington, and the, we have a threat now coming out of DC. If you're familiar, have you heard of Asian carp? An invasive fish is plaguing the Great Lakes, and the Army Corps of Engineers is going to spend $2 billion to construct a lock and dam on the Chicago River to keep Asian carp out of Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, and so on. That line item comes out of the same that we fight for every year for Everglades restoration. So we have one great governor and two U.S. senators. They have eight governors and 16 senators, so you can see where we are. So... The hope here is we can team up together to plus up that line item so we're not fighting against each other. What's good for the Everglades can certainly be good for the Great Lakes. There's plenty of money in Washington to solve these problems. But the colonel of the Army Corps of Engineers who sits in Jacksonville, he says if he can receive two to 300 a year for 10 years, he can build up this program. That's a two to $3 billion investment just on the federal side to complement what's happening at the state side these reservoirs and these removing of the uh, dams and dikes that have been in place for decades come down quicker. They get built quicker. And to Dominic's question, we start to see the benefits, the benefits to the municipalities, the benefits to the ecosystem, the benefits to the 77 endangered and threatened species that call the Everglades in particular home. That's the hope. Marco Rubio on the Senate Appropriations Committee Debbie Wasserman Schultz potentially is the next chairman of the House Appropriations Committee. That's bacon that's going to come down to Florida that we desperately need. And now we have a resident at the moment who is from Palm Beach, just down the street at Mar-a-Lago, who understands that the investment is critical in this ecosystem. We need the money. Take the partisanship away because this is a unifying issue. It brings Republicans and Democrats together and the fundamental 
denominator there is money. We need it both from Washington to complement what's happening out of Tallahassee. Dominic, 10 years, 2030. <laughs> All right. That's, that concludes our panel. Thank you guys for having us and give our panelists a round of applause.